Welcome to the World Travel Market uh, Aviation uh, Seminar. I'm John Strickland of JLS Consulting. It's my pleasure to host the aviation program again this year. Good to see that many of you have managed to get here despite this morning's travel, travel problems with the DLR. And we're hoping to have a good session for you. We've got a great panel of experts from the industry as usual to talk about uh, all the challenges the industry's faced. Every year is different. Uh, the, the landscape is quite different to what it was 12 months ago when we all met here then. Today we're going to start off interestingly with some new research which has been done by Inc. Is it Inc. Publishing we called it? Inc. And we have uh, Inc.'s director of research here, Kevin Miller, to run through that, looking at passenger trends, looking across different global regions, different airline business models. Ken, uh, Kevin's going to take us through this information and this research and then we're going to use that as a starting point for our panel debate. We've got an hour available to us, possibly a few minutes more depending on how things go. And we'll certainly welcome your participation uh, as we go on a bit later in the session with uh, some questions from the floor. So enjoy the, enjoy the session and we'll talk to you again in a few minutes. So I'm going to hand the floor straight to you, Kevin, for the passenger research. Sorry about that. It works as well. Right. I'm Kevin Miller. I'm director of research for the Global Passenger Survey, which is an independent airline satisfaction survey, which is launched in partnership with 40 airlines worldwide. Today's presentation will show exclusive headlines for World Travel Market from the latest results from Wave 2 of the survey. In introduction, uh, the Global Passage Survey, as I said, launched in 2014, is currently with 11, sorry, 110,000 respondents. And this survey is an independent survey hosted and analyzed by the research agency VOAC and sponsored by Inc, who are the world's leading travel media company. Uh, there's a lot of data to look at, so I'll be quite quick moving through the slides, um, but just to touch on the methodology, um, it's a web survey and the survey link is placed by the airlines themselves on their own digital platforms, which can be travel documents, FFP, newsletters, social media, or even printed in the in-flight magazine. Passengers' responses are confidentially collated and analyzed by the research agency. The questionnaire covers a range of topics, including satisfaction, which we're going to look at today, travel habits, ancillary product consumption, and in-flight entertainment and media. The survey is a standardized survey across all airlines, and this allows benchmarking for each airline against regional averages. And it's the aggregated reports and results that we will see today in this presentation. This is the survey group that we see today. So there are 40 airlines, but today's highlights will focus on aggregated results from wave one and wave two for Europe and North America. North America is only wave one. We're currently surveying wave two. So today we're going to look at four topics uh, which we will discuss in the panel. Uh, the most important is passenger experience, which focuses on the performance of each airline against um, satisfaction and rebooking factors. Then we'll look at digital assets and how these are being used by airline passengers. And then a key area is the whole low-cost, long-haul phenomenon. And we'll look at two case studies today from Europe and from Asia Pacific. And then finally, the role of travel media and how it uh, it's key in driving ticket sales, rebooking, and as a brand extension of the airline. So moving swiftly to satisfaction. If we look at Europe, this is the full service results aggregated. Um, passengers were asked to score uh, a satisfaction for their airline on a five-point scale. And what we see here are the positive results. 
uh, against a fairly standard range of operative metrics. If you just look along there, you would see things from punctuality to courtesy, lots of service factors, uh, looking at the media and looking at the digital assets of the airline. If we look at what actually improved wave on wave for Europe full service, we can see that six out of the 15 metrics improved wave on wave with some stabilizing and some negligible shifts for punctuality, airport check-in. Overall satisfaction, as you can see, remains fairly high with service factors such as courtesy and comfort of cabin performing very well. Inclusive services that passengers have paid a premium for, such as luggage, food, and the IFE system, are performing well and are being managed, but not at the expense of price, which, as you can see, saw a 14-point increase. Um, price and quality seem to be managed, but not at the expense of investment in price. If we look at the decreases just for Europe, for service, Satisfaction actually decreased in nine areas with a small drop for punctuality, although that is still number one. What we're seeing is airlines' digital assets such as the website, online check-in, email communications, and particularly social media that simply aren't front of mind for passengers. Perhaps they're perceived as a hygiene factor with passengers focusing more on the services that they require and they paid a premium. This contrast between service and digital assets is an emerging pattern that we'll see repeated in other regions later on. One thing to point out are the loyalty scheme benefits from frequent prior programs. These are of very little interest in Europe and actually seem to be worsening in their offer and much lower than in North America, which we'll see shortly. Looking at America, um, this is only wave one for America, um, but we can see a very different pattern emerging already. Punctuality is scoring well, but the loyalty scheme benefits, as you can see, are much more important and front of mind in the US, where this industry for loyalty is more established over the last 30 years. However, although they are getting benefits from their loyalty schemes, they still want value for money, and particularly in service. Um, but here you see loyalty is the sixth most important satisfaction factor. If we compare briefly North America's results with Europe, you can see just how much Im more important loyalty is in this region. Also, you can see social media for the airline is very low and lowest for both Europe and North America. Um, and this is something we will comment on later. If we look at low cost in Europe now, you can see a very positive result for satisfaction wave on wave. Nine out of 15 scores increased and only a negligible drop for price. Price, however, is the most important concern and it's the defining factor for low cost. But service factors are still important to passengers. They still want value for money across the board. They may be price conscious, but they also want the most out of what is still free of charge to them. And, and as we can see, service factors are doing very well in Europe uh, with only a very negligible impact on cost there at number one. What we see for low cost as well is digital assets are more front of mind and more valued by the low cost passenger as they are a key mechanism for the success of these airlines and this business model. Um, and it's important that uh, a successful web experience is effective to gain loyalty where competition on routes and on websites is, is very fierce. If we move to rebooking for low cost, uh, you'll see a very different pattern there. Um, we asked passengers who've flown twice with an airline to rate uh, which of the factors were most important to them. Um, if you look at Europe here in full service, uh, price is important. Price and punctuality are normally number one, number two. But again, service factors are pushing through um, and are still very key to the full service carrier. 
Again, digital assets are less front of mind for full service, even site usability. If we compare rebooking against satisfaction, you will see that it's a very different picture. So what people actually talk about in terms of what's important in satisfaction is very different to, for the reasons why they actually book. Um, so you can see price, of course, number one. It's almost an inverse pattern between rebooking and actual satisfaction. So it's quite a lot to take in there, but it's quite an interesting pattern emerging. If we look at the US for rebooking there, uh, that actually is full service, not low cost. Um, price is important, but as you can see, loyalty is second most important, so the benefits coming from the FFP scheme are really important to the passenger, uh, although they may have scored this lower for satisfaction. Um, but it is followed by, again, service factors with site usability, the only highest scoring uh, web asset at seventh. What we're seeing here is social media and social media communications having a negligible effect on rebooking, and this is something that we've already seen. If we compare the US's rebooking factors with um, set their satisfaction, Again, you see this pattern quite different to what people will talk about in terms of satisfaction, but what actually makes them book. And rebooking in Europe for low-cost carriers, price is the leading differentiator. It's over twice as important uh, than for full-service carriers, and it's obviously key to the low-cost model. Here we see in low cost, the digital asset score much more high for service, and this is most important with competition on these routes and using the site for an enjoyable experience is key to retaining loyalty with their customers. So moving on to how mobile usage affects booking. Um, this is quite a complex slide, but it just really shows how mobile usage is used in full service Europe, full service North America, and low cost. Low cost carriers' usage of apps has, um, despite the increase in their digital properties, is lower than in full service carriers, both in Europe and North America. Um, partly because I think a lot of low cost carriers have come into the mobile market later than full service. Um, but not a great take up presently. This well may change with further investment. Now, if we move to the topic that I think is probably of most interest to our panel, which is the low cost long haul phenomenon. So, this is low cost carriers flying transatlantically or across uh, continents with a low cost paid for model. Uh, if we look at a single European low-cost carrier here, and how it performs against the Europe aggregated results we saw earlier, what we see is a nearly overall positive trend, which highlighted there in green. Again, after price, service factors are the metrics that passengers are most concerned and are front of mind. What we see is the perception, perhaps, of a full-service um, experience on long-haul low-cost uh, seems largely to be fulfilled by this particular airline in Europe. Services, however, that are paid for, such as the IFE and food, are not surprisingly perhaps saw less satisfaction uh, for being paid for, perhaps. If we briefly look at rebooking, for it's clearly price was the main factor here. Um, though not as important, perhaps, as a low-cost carrier. Service factors are, and our consideration seem to be successfully fulfilled, but ultimately passengers are looking for long-haul value. This does raise the question of how full-service carriers can maintain a competitive edge in Europe against this new model that's emerging. If we briefly just look at the Asian market and look at the Asian uh, low-cost 
example we have here, low cost, long haul, overall we could see quite a negative result. Performance was largely lower than even the Asian low cost average aggregated results, with price particularly a concern. And again, if we look at rebooking for long haul low cost, uh, price is far above the average for these airlines, indicating it was largely this reason for booking with perhaps little expectation of any added value. With the majority of normal low cost carriers in Asia, Pacific particularly, offering long haul international routes and competition fierce for these uh, intercontinental routes, it's not clear from these results that there is actually a recognizable model or any standout for a hybrid offering in this region. Finally, if we move to the role travel media plays in airline sales, what I'm showing here is uh, a question that passengers were asked. Where do you look for airline tickets? And have you booked an airline ticket from this media platform? What we see nearly in all regions, uh, digital boarding pass documents see a very high booking rate, uh, sometimes higher than non-traditional social media for the airline. In low-cost Europe, boarding pass documents were second only to booking sites, with in-flight magazines seeing a high rate, higher than all traditional display media, and a research level equal to that of social media and recommendation. And in North America, boarding pass sales was second only again to airline and group booking sites, followed by the InFlight magazine for researching and ticket sales. Again, what we see is social media lagging behind and also social media, as we saw earlier, of little impact for rebooking. We also see some statements we asked about travel media, particularly in flight magazines. And we can see there's a lot here to look at, but uh, if we look perhaps at the top results, 56% of readers say they learn about the airline from the magazine. 72% uh, learn about the airline's routes, and destinations. What we learn here is that um, the Inflight magazine is very much a marketing tool for airlines at a brand extension and also a very successful booking platform in terms of information. So in summary, if we look at satisfaction rebooking, we can see full service in Europe slightly decreasing, but in uh, Europe for low cost increasing, North America on the whole very high. What we also see is full service carriers prioritize service, but this isn't to say that low cost carriers uh, ignore it. They expect service and price, particularly if it's uh, an inclusive service that they still get with their ticket. North America, we saw, is driven by a loyalty um, industry, uh, which is very established there. But as I said earlier, social media has little or no effect on rebooking across all regions. If we look at the low-cost model for uh, long haul, it's largely successful in Europe, and the perception of service seems largely to be fulfilled by the experience in Europe. Briefly touching on Asia, the model for this uh, long haul, low-cost, doesn't really seem to offer any standout from other low-cost carriers in the region. Um, again, Perhaps there's very little difference between a lot of routes and a lot of airlines who are already flying low cost. And touching again on uh, airlines media, it continues to be valued, at least in perception, by the passengers and seen as very important and a cherished part of the in-flight experience, uh, with surprisingly high ticket sales driven from boarding passes and digital travel documents. Overall, mo mobile media usage in the low-cost region is quite low, and perhaps it may develop. Um, and as we've seen, magazines particularly can be seen as a very successful brand extension for airlines and a rebooking platform. 
So that is all the data that we'll discuss today. There's quite a lot of it, but I'm sure we'll touch on it uh, in a minute. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Kevin. Very interesting. A lot of data to get through in a short amount of time, so appreciate the, uh, the way you were able to uh, summarize that. I, I realize that what I forgot to do at the beginning, I said we had a great panel of experts, and I didn't introduce anybody else. So I would like to introduce the other three gentlemen next to me. First of all, we have uh, Raphael Schwartzman, who is uh, VP Europe for IATA, of course, a global, global industry body. So welcome to London, Raphael, to the world travel market. Next to Nat, and I think, uh, next to Matt, sorry, next to Raphael, sorry, we have Nat, Nat uh, Piper, who is Senior Vice President Europe, Middle East and Africa. And Nat, you're new to the role. You're new to coming over here in Europe, I believe, based in Paris, and you uh, made your way across here to London yesterday, so welcome to the World Travel Markets, and uh, look forward to speaking to you about Delta. Sorry? Oh, sorry, Delta. Delta Airlines, apologies for that. Yes, yeah, Delta Airlines, a major It's what US my business course. card says anyway. Eh? You know. <laughs> we'll see after this. Yeah, and next, uh, next in that, we have uh, Helgi uh, Bjorgvinsson, who is Senior Vice President Marketing and Sales for Iceland Air. So we have European representation of an industry body with IATA, and two carriers who uh, focus a lot on the North Atlantic market, which was covered by Kevin's uh, research. So I'll come back to the panel first of all. Uh, first of all, Raphael, uh, from an industry point of view in Europe, were there any surprises in that research? Did it resonate with you in terms of what you would see from your members? Um, no, no. Well, I, I think uh, I, looking at the research, uh, we're not very surprised. I mean, obviously, uh, the number one uh, element that we see there is price, and price sensitivity obviously uh, in Europe is extremely uh, high. I mean, especially when, when we have, a, a, you know, when we, in the 90s, when we deregulated the market, you know, and everything, that, that has created a, a high degree of competition, and, and obviously there is a service standard that is assumed that is there. So, so price is the number one by far. I think there is a big gap between that and the rest. Then um, I guess the, 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 the second factor that I w we, w we have uh, in our own research found is uh, the schedule and the flight time to be a key factor, which I guess is linked somehow to the punctuality that we have saw there uh, already. Uh, one difference in terms of what we see is still, uh, w compared to the research, is the, the, the weight of the frequent flyer or the loyalty programs, which we still see obviously a big importance uh, to it, I guess uh, that will change probably with demographic analysis, and, and, I, and I think demographics uh, could have an impact in many of the outcomes that we have seen in, in this survey as well as the IATA surveys. So I think in, in, in many ways we're aligned, obviously, um, and, and then on other areas of, of, uh, of service, uh, we see already passengers, let's say, taking for granted certain things. I mean, you already assume that you're going to have certain level of services on board, uh, and, and therefore those are not necessarily appreciated as much, probably, because it's already a given, I mean, having certain minimum level of services uh, and things like that. So we see those things diminishing, and, and I guess uh, that's, that's, that's uh, somehow related to what we see in the survey. Okay, thanks, Rafael. And Nat, from Delta's perspective, uh, focusing, obviously, on a global operation, but focusing on your, your home market, the U.S., and your big presence here in Europe, did that ring true for you? And could I ask you also to make a particular comment about loyalty programs? I was surprised myself to see that there's still a greater waiting in the U.S. market about that point. Sure. Um, multifaceted question. So let's start with common themes for both markets. Um, rebooking was the information that truthfully was most interesting for me there and, and factors you know it's varying degrees of, of issues that get people on the airplane the first time the question is how do you build a loyal customer going forward punctuality makes complete sense right on time with bags um, I plan from point A to point B I want to make sure that I get there efficiently second from a staff perspective courtesy I feel valued by the airline, you know, flight attendants, everybody at the airport. From the time that I become, or in essence, put my travel journey in Delta's hands, I want to make sure that I'm appreciated and valued. And then thirdly, the actual in-flight experience, um, not only from a staff perspective, but also the hard goods on the airplane, IFE, um, brand new seats, experience for all classes of service, very, very important going forward. 
in the U.S., loyalty continues to be very critical. And I think just a, a word on that, so many times folks think globally in frequent flyer programs and they think it's all about free tickets. And I think that's an important part of it. But in the U.S., one of the things that has really been a key contributor, in my opinion, to U.S. carriers becoming stronger is our ability to segment the product offerings that we have. And so for our highest yielding passengers, folks that are paying us $2,000 to fly from New York City to Chicago, very high yields to fly internationally as well, they're certainly accruing miles that can lead to free tickets. But the other component to that is there are privileges that then come with that. So whether it's upgraded, upgraded tickets going forward, whether it's lounge access, um, the ability to choose your seat in advance, other things that we've done to segment that passenger's journey and our ability to offer a number of different products on the same airplane and really tailor it to what our customers want is contributing to higher yields and driving a lot of, of very good top line performance. And I was reading, I mean, in the past loyalty programs was something that airlines felt they needed for mm -hmm. exactly the reasons you described, but then Delta, for example, actually makes money out of this loyalty program. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that directly? Yeah. Well, I, th I think it, it multifaceted to that too. I mean, the customer that everybody is chasing, certainly from a, a full service airline perspective, is the high yield passenger. Um, and so one of the ways to then endear loyalty is to have products that, that people want to experience the first time and then we'll come back and, and do that again. Um, the frequent flyer program tends to be a very good hook for that, John. And you know, truthfully, there still is the global concept. Everybody loves bargains in, inherent in what you're doing and free tickets are great. And so that's part of the foundational level of it and, and certainly is, is a lot of, of traction in our market. Um, American Express is a very loyal partner for Delta, um, at loyalty credit cards, and that's all hinged based on the ability to spend money on that card, generate Delta Sky Miles, and then that just helps part of the loyalty equation for us, bringing more high yield passengers and putting them on our airplane. And Helgi, uh, Iceland is in a very different position. Your home market in Iceland is a small local population you're very focused on traffic between Europe and the US and vice versa. So you're dealing with multiple cultures, but to get people to make a trip on Iceland Air involving a stopover in, in Reykjavik, price has got to come into that equation. So again, did that make sense to you when you saw that in research coming through or are there other factors that uh, you think are important from Iceland Air's point of view? Uh, I think uh, that Iceland Air appreciate the opportunity to be on this uh, panel. Uh, in our case, this did not come as a, a big surprise. We, of course, do our own research, and, and it is uh, the price and the quality of service that, uh, that matters, uh, and uh, how we meet the, uh, the expectation of uh, our uh, customers. Maybe one thing that uh, this survey does not cover, and we in the airline industry in general are not very good at, that is transparency. Uh, I think that is something that our uh, customers are all also appreciate. They do not like to see a price and they and then uh, pay three times what they what they, they uh, saw uh, in the beginning. So I think this is the key. It is the, uh, the price, the value for money and the, the transparency. And uh, we have been fortunate enough to, uh, to grow our business for the past few years and, and we me measure, uh, of course, our NPS. That has moved from 12 in 2009 to 60 in, in uh, 2015, and that is uh, the key to to, uh, to survive in this very competitive environment. So, in terms of pricing, what are, you, are you effectively saying that when you go on the Iceland Air website uh, and you see the first headline price for an itinerary, that is what you pay? You, you don't end up two or three screens later with bits added on that you weren't expecting, different costs and admin fees and so on. Uh, that is what I was referring to in terms of transparency. Yes. Okay. And Kevin, you know, one thing that surprised me, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of in some ways talking down the importance of uh, digital media. It's not as effective as perhaps we would all think. Yeah, I was surprised from the results that it's quite clear. Uh, it may well be an effect of perception and what you were talking about earlier as uh, seen as a hygiene factor. So if the website was a successful experience, it may well not be remembered. Um, but certainly social media particularly 
uh, and airlines and social media where there's a lot of investment at the moment, in the perception of the passenger at least, doesn't really seem to be effective right now. Uh, again, if we t targeted and segmented the audience, we may see a younger demographic responding more positively to that. Uh, in terms of perhaps the more senior business passenger, um, that may be the case of what we see here, that social media is simply not key to their uh, experience and indeed their rebooking. Um, but obviously there's a contrast there with print media, which at least for now is, is still very much an effective tool and at least front of mind for the passenger when asked. So did your research bring out that difference in age profile or did you not go that deep? Uh, yes, so if we look at the data, at the back data, you are seeing that trend. And um, I think also for the business passenger, maybe they're not using an app perhaps as we saw um, even in low cost. Um, and there may be some hesitations around app usage, uh, booking and rebooking through an app. Uh, again, I think driven probably by age. Um, this, this issue of social media, Rafael, we think that Europe has now got short haul, about half its passengers are flying on low cost airlines, and particularly the, the big two, you know, Ryanair and EasyJet. What has this meant for uh, IATA members in Europe? H has there been extra work to invest in social media? Are they facing these challenges that despite any efforts they may make, there's not really evidence of a, a return so far? Well, I mean, um, <clears throat> yeah, well, you just said it. I mean, in intra-Europe, we have uh, about 250 million passengers that are going uh, with uh, the low-cost carriers, mm -hmm. as we call it, or about 40% of the traffic, right? Um, and, and then we see there, uh, I think there is a mixed uh, behavior, I would say, if you would, because a lot of that has uh, created uh, uh, a lot of traffic that is for pleasure, weekend traffic and stuff like that. We, we have a lot in Europe. Um, but if we look into, uh, uh, well, one thing is first the connectivity, which is, I guess, a different thing than social media, if you would, right? Uh, what, what we see is that, I mean, uh, and as, as it was said before, uh, you know, probably having a good um, web or a good app is not an option anymore, right? Is th that's a given. That's something that has to be there and it's assumed to, to uh, by everyone, I guess. So uh, we, don't, we don't see a way out of that. Uh, and, and we don't see, uh, I mean, I think airlines have invested a lot of money into that area. Um, in terms of social media, uh, we, we are not too focused in our research in the social media impact itself, uh, because we, we are you know, more focused in terms of the behavior of purchasing maybe, or how can we facilitate the passenger experience overall, right? So apps and the web can actually drive a lot of facilitation in terms of passenger experience, and that's where we are more focused on. Uh, you know, not only just checking in, but um, passengers are looking to have, obviously, first of all, serve service, right? Then you wanna have, which is what we do today, right? You, you, you know, when I came in here, um, I basically get my, I, I got my boarding pass, uh, you know, automatically my QR, you know, I, I received it. I went with my mobile, checked in, came in here, used the automatic, you know, border control and all that. So I, 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 I want this seamless journey and, and, I, and I do use the app for that, right? Or, or, or the, 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 the smartphone. So a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of effort has been gone into that area uh, a lot is about also having control of the journey and that there is a lot of potential there as well where we, you know, passengers would like to have much more control on their baggage, for example, you know, am I able to get information or even flight rebooking information or everything that is linked to your, to your uh, journey. Um, and, and even going farther, what passengers are looking at is um, how to get more uh, information of the whole journey uh, which does not only include the airlines, but includes airports, or it might include your hotel, or it might be your taxi, or so if you're delayed, everything has been kind of arranged based on your already um, book uh, things, but we are not interconnected as well to be able to do that. So um, again, the, the, the social media aspect of it, I, I cannot comment a lot on that, but definitely 
the need for uh, quality uh, connectivity, web apps uh, and, and interconnectivity between the information that we have today across the value chain, it is one of the most critical things that we see. Well, it seems that for your members, what you're saying is that you know, this convenience factor is important. You know, we all want the, the hassle-free uh, travel experience, but they maybe not the same engagement on social media yet. With low-cost carriers, if I understood you right, Kevin, the low-cost carriers are much more active in social media, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ryanair, for example, at the moment, you can't yet, I think they're about to change it, you can't yet do a, a boarding card online. I know you can for EasyJet. So there's a bit of a split between the social elements and the business convenience. Yeah, I think the low-cost carriers, uh, say in Europe, have come to that market in terms of app usage um, later, but social media sooner. So there is a, as you say, there's a slight difference in the results there. And, and how are you, what's your take on this? Because I, I mean, Iceland as a country is known for being way up there, uh, adopting all the new technology. It's not your biggest source of traffic, but. From that perspective, how do you see it across uh, uh, the markets that you're acting in? I think in uh, general, I mean, if we're going to be in this industry, it's not a question if, but uh, how and how much you're going to invest in, in digital. Uh, that is maybe one of the reasons that uh, we have decided to uh, go fleet wide uh, Wi-Fi on the, on the transatlantic. That will give us a lot of opportunities in uh, servicing the, the uh, consumer uh, at the same time. and, and uh, saving us uh, cost on, on some points, even though, of course, it's uh, in an investment at the, at the same time. Uh, Did so you say you offer that free, the Wi-Fi? We, we charge uh, for, that's the reason we are a hybrid carrier. We, I, I was trying to define if we are the low cost or the full service you. or somewhere in between. I guess everybody is trying to, to copy that model, model. Everybody is gradually moving towards the middle. Uh, for instance, in North America, who would think that uh, a traditional low-cost carrier would offer flat bed on, on uh, between the west coast and the east coast. Is that a low-cost yeah. or a hybrid or a, or a full service? Uh, at the same time, a uh, lot of the uh, legacy carriers, uh, particularly in Europe, are introducing light fares that they are charging for, uh, for luggage. So I think in, in general, the, the, uh, the business is all moving towards the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nat, uh, digital in, in your market and social media, you've got a, a big age range of customers, I would guess. John, I think so, and, and just to you know, not deflect that the full service carrier doesn't have you know important resources allocated to the web experience, but it, it really boils down to common sense. So it is. I agree with with my colleagues here that it's become a mandatory facet of for passengers to be able to get information. And for the demographics we talked a little bit earlier, um, for my 14 year old daughter. All she wants to do is go on the website and or on the app, I'm sorry, on her phone, and here's what gate we're going out of. Here are the three restaurants within walking distance. Here's the shop that I can go buy headphones, and will you give me money so I can go do that? Um, but it, it's a mandatory piece of that travel experience. But from our perspective, there are two really good business reasons to invest in that as well. Number one, it's a tremendous channel to endear brand loyalty, not only to provide information about your company and the products you offer and where you fly and what those experiences could be, but traditional research will show you that you generate some of your strongest brand loyalty rectifying situations in which you screw up. Now look, we don't strive to screw up in any situation at all, but flights get delayed, we lose bags, common knowledge, but if we can recover and provide that information seamlessly and quickly to passengers that realize, yeah, they did screw up, they acknowledged it, they apologized for it, and that information is easy for me to get. History will, data will tell you that you've now generated somebody that's going to come back and, and book you again. The second reason that it's important to invest there is, is truthfully, there is no if more efficient booking channel for us economically than directly on our website, whether it's a, a fee function you know, the traditional travel agent model, there's nothing more efficient for us than for folks that book directly on delta.com or through our, our app via um, phones and, and other things. And so that kind of gives you the, the math to drive and, and continue to, to invest there as well. Let's just stick with you a moment, uh, Nat. I mean, Delta's been through quite a journey. I was just talking to you before we came in, your last uh, quarterly financial results had record-breaking profit margin. 
uh, the business is solidly profitable as it has been for the last few years. Yet, if we'd been sitting here maybe even as little as five years ago, we, Europeans might have been talking about US carriers as being, you know, no hope, basket cases. But Delta has really led the way. It merged with uh, Northwest Airlines some years back. Uh, yet we hear subjective comment, US media, you know, customers not been happy about the kind of things which Kevin's survey showed, punctuality, pricing and so on. But you call yourselves, you know, the on-time machine. You're getting this profitability, you know, where customers are giving you uh, the, the, the fares uh, to a degree willingly because you're competing. Just give us a bit of a flavor how, how that's happened against the image we might have of U.S. carriers. Well, first of all, your commentary, I've been in the industry and with Northwest, now Delta, for 18 years. So everybody knows that this is a cyclical business and many years of rubbing nickels together um, in the finance department, wondering how we were going to get to the next quarter. So um, truly, this is a, a time of, of an up cycle for U.S. carriers. Um, personal aside, Delta's third quarter was incredibly successful. Um, we made more money in that quarter than several times in my past. The airline by whom I was employed was not worth that much money yet from an equity perspective. So it's sobering and there are a lot of us that have very long memories um, for this business. And, and if you're in it long enough, you know, it just that, that's part of the show. I think from Delta's perspective, um, a couple of, of moments come to mind. Certainly the merger in, in 2008 and 2009 with Northwest gave us scale. And part of, of any industry and in economics, fragmentation is very difficult. And so generating scale helps one start to, to get better returns on fixed assets and, and gives you a platform to at least potentially be successful. And it was in a presentation earlier today um, in a Visit USA place where they talked and showed consolidation and how it's come, as, as most of you are familiar, from a very fragmented industry to basically three big network carriers and, and one big um, low cost or, or hybrid carrier. So I think that was piece number one. Piece number two was in 2009 as we were going through integration and, and cash was tight because you know, had to merge systems, had to do a lot of different things had way too many airplanes of, of different places, and senior team had leadership to say and had a vision, the only way we're gonna break this model is if we can become a carrier of choice. We need to be able to make investments in products so that we are competitive with global carriers flying internationally. We offer flatbed seats and video in every seat, and. Um, make investments. My background is pr primarily finance, as you know, John, and as we talked about earlier, I'm sitting there in 2010 thinking, this is all great and aspirational. There is no way we're going to generate returns on this because n the U.S. carrier experience had never seen investment in product actually be then rewarded and have people want to pay that extra yield to fly on your airplanes. And so fast forward five years, you know, we've reinvigorated our entire international fleet with flatbed seats in, in, in every business class airplane we fly, video in, in tremendous customer amenities in all classes of service, and it really is, has spooled. Now, oil then has come and give us an, another windfall to both continue investing in our product as well as shore up our financial situation going forward. And so, you know, Delta as a U.S. carrier is one rung from being an investment grade rated company in the U.S., which I mean, airlines and investment grade never were, were used in the same sentence. And so I gain comfort for when that inevitable down cycle comes, we're in much better stead to be able to survive that and continue to be a, an airline of choice that passengers are going to want to book and fly. I mean, what marks out, uh, I mean, you, I think, well, you were the first integration of this consolidation process, Northwest and Delta. Mm -hmm. But what marks that out for being so successful? If we look at American is maybe a bit too recent, you mm -hmm. know, still in the relatively early stages of digesting U.S. Airways. Mm -hmm. United and Continental is much further down the line, but all we see is headlines about problems, computer systems not working, punctuality issues, never mind getting through CEOs at a fair mm -hmm. pace recently. What really marks you out? Is it that investment in the service that you've been able to do now? John, I think there's two things that I would say. Number one is we have a tremendous first mover advantage in going first and being able to not only take advantage of consolidation, 
and get through our integration such that, because anybody that's ever been through a merger, a consolidation, whether on a personal or on a professional level, it takes time to adjust and all you're thinking about is how do I integrate this? Well, we were the first one through the forest, so to speak, and now we could start focusing again on running our airline. And that's been a, a very advantageous for us. And then I think second, and investing in our product and all the other things that come with that, don't have to worry about having cash reserved for the integration hiccups that usually come. And then I think secondly, something that we think is unique at Delta, we can, any, uh, any airline can go buy the latest and greatest airplane. Any airline can go invest in flatbed products that, that can be matched by someone else. But the thing that we think is unique at Delta and our customer scores show it is really the staff and the cor corporate culture that we have. Um, you s we saw in, in both the EU um, renewal booking from a US perspective as well, um, friendliness, courteousness of staff, um, loyalty from our employees as well. And, and that's something that we think makes Delta unique and we see that in a lot of the qualitative data and research that we do on board. Thanks, Nat. Uh, Kevin, I mean, one thing that didn't come out of a survey, nobody said they chose an airline because of a type of aircraft or whether an aircraft was new or old or latest yeah. technology or old technology. No, that wasn't one of the metrics at all. Um, if I could return to the idea of courtesy th that you mentioned, um, I was surprised through the survey how important that is, certainly in perception. Um, I mean, I think myself, I probably never booked uh, a plane because of the courtesy, um, but uh, I'm... Um, contradicted by the results you see it's third fourth right be it low cost be it Europe I in Asia you, you didn't see here it's even higher and it's it's a, it's something which is a real uh, factor something that passengers already are thinking about I think equally you equally to it and you know, it depends on how you phrase the how the fresh question is phrased but think about your personal experiences in any facet whether it's travel or not you may not book because think of, of courtesy of staff, but we can all remember personal experiences where you've had a bad interaction mm -hmm. with staff. And so it's kind of the anti-rebooking, so to speak, that would, would rate there. I, I think statistically, with, if you have a bad experience, um, that will be a handful of people and probably once. I think for it to really affect data at this level, mm -hmm. it'd have to be pretty bad and a lot of it a lot of the time mm -hmm. to actually impact on a result. And, um, people are having a good experience with, with courtesy and they really seem to value it as a, a real asset almost for, for the airline. Just want to bring uh, Raphael back in here. Only in the last week, IATA announced some of its own research and it relates very much to what we're talking about there about developing profitability. You found that passenger happiness wasn't obviously <laughs> correlated with airline profitability. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yes, that is that is true. I think uh, uh, the the surveys that you know we have done obviously didn't find a strong correlation between passenger happiness and airline profitability, right? Uh, which I guess it has to do. I was thinking, you know, I have uh, a good friend, a good airline C, well, a, a good performing airline CEO, who said, uh, you know, that you know everything we do has to be linked to cost speed to market and quality of products. If we get any of those partially right, not all of them right, then you are off, right? You will be having trouble. So I, I would say it is not enough just to get, you know, courtesy being great. You have to get all the other things right to be able to satisfy the customer uh, in a way, uh, I guess they're all linked, if you would, uh, into efficiency, they are all linked to building brand, you know, because at the end this is a lot about building the brand uh, itself. Uh, and, and, and one of the things I think that the North American carriers have is with the consolidation, they have also been able to not only drive efficiency, but they've been able to build strong brands, right? And that's also, I think, helps a lot. Um, and, and I, you know, on the re reflecting on that as well, when we talk about, um, uh, again, equipment or, or, or people being, you know, linked, buying the best equipment is not just the solution, right? Because it's obviously that the results are there. Everybody has access to this great equipment anyway. So um, it is getting the balance right. And I think when you see that, you see the profitability. Obviously, the other factors that 
do hinder profitability, and especially in in the in the European context, for example, which is much different than the North American one, where we see the fragmentation uh, in the European market, and not just fragmentation on the airlines. We have fragmentation uh, everywhere in Europe, right on the skies. You know, we still have fragmented skies. I mean, we walk around, we move around Europe without any. Uh, uh, well, with freedom of movement, we cannot move in the air with freedom of movement. So that obviously... Because the air traffic controls uh, run by different countries, not necessarily in the most efficient geographic sense. Exactly. We do still have borders in the air, mm -hmm. not necessarily on the ground. So when we move around, we have, uh, let's say, uh, 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 we don't have the most efficient infrastructure, right? So we are duplicating or even more. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure needed to make efficient flights, which means that um, it drives higher costs, which means then that we cannot provide the best service, and it's also not environmentally friendly, which, by the, by the way, in Europe and, and, and North America, it's quite an important thing. I mean, we have to be environmentally friendly or sustainable. So, in general, it is not, as you said, just linked to the happiness uh, coefficient, if you would, uh, there are many other uh, 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 areas that will impact that decision. And Probably obviously, again, the price is always... The soft pr element price is and uh, the human relationship always. with passengers, um, it, I was going to say, is maybe tougher in Europe because the consolidation process that Nat alluded to in the USA, where I think the top four or five airlines account for, what, over 90% of the market in Europe, I think the top four or five is about 60-something percent with the three big uh, legacy groups and the two low cost. Mm -hmm. And we see, uh, even today, I read Lufthansa is heading for possibly another strike, this time cabin crew. Air France has its staff tearing the shirts off the backs of its management, and they're trying to deliver good service. Are there bigger challenges going forward to deliver profitability and, and good service for airlines in Europe compared to the US? Yes, that's probably uh, the, the, the first simple answer is yes, obviously. Uh, the, the, there are many challenges in Europe. I mean, the way, I mean, air, Air transport is it's, it's a business that needs to run in partnership. And we have seen that with the success uh, of, for example, the, the Gulf carriers, where there is a compromise not only on the, on the airline side, but also on the government side, right, to make aviation um, uh, a, you know, a, a valuable uh, industry for the development of the country or the region, et cetera. In Europe, we have a different approach. We are, as we many say, we, we said here, we are over-regulated. If you look at, for example, um, you know, PNRs, you know, obviously we do need uh, the, the information, right? But we today have uh, a, a European approach, but we also have 28 states having different approach of how do they want to get data, right? Instead of looking at what is it that we want to achieve as, 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 a, as Europe, right? How, what are the standards there? You know, and so you, work, you, you kind of work backwards to get that there. Mm -hmm. That's only one example of, of how uh, interdependent is the industry of many other stakeholders around the value chain that need to work together. So in Europe, we do have a situation where we just spoke about the, the, the air traffic management system. We just, you know, I just mentioned the example of the uh, PNR, uh, the information that is necessary, but it's not necessarily uh, done in an EU kind of way. So it's not, it's not using the EU standard, but is, is kind of driving, every government is driving its own standard. So the fragmentation, not only on the airline side, but also on the approach that we have as, as a region, mm -hmm. it's actually um, having a huge impact in terms of... To see what the EU comes out of its new uh, aviation policy, which I think is due in a few months. Very Just important. want to turn to Helgi. I mean, we, we, to weave in, uh, we'll get, come to the floor in just a moment, uh, but you, you talked about the long-haul low-cost model. And Helgi, you, you, you know, Iceland Air in market share, I believe, is pretty small on the North Atlantic, but you've got a big network. You know, you're, you're sort of you know, punching above your weight, profitable as well, like Delta, using older aircraft at the present time, but it still seems to be delivering. Passengers are still getting on Iceland Air flights. Can you just elaborate a bit more about that and give me your initial thoughts about long haul low cost? Is that going to be a challenge, for example, to you? Uh, I think uh, some people refer to Iceland Air as the first low cost carrier on the transatlantic, and we have been around for 80 years, so I think uh, that uh, makes it sustainable. Uh, maybe backtrack a little bit. I, I think sometimes we, uh, the airline business in general is not a very complicated business. Sometimes we try to make it complicated <laughs> as much as we can. Uh, but in general, it works the same way as other industries. If you have happy employees, 
they provide, provide better service. Better service uh, improves your NPS score, and the MP, uh, better NPS scores uh, improves your profitability. So it is not a, a very complicated uh, formula. Uh, yes, uh, even though we have been doubling our markets here on the trans transatlantic for the past uh, few years, we have less than 2%, and I, I believe you are probably 40 or 50, 50 times bigger uh, than Iceland there, but that, that also makes a lot of opportunities for, for us to, to, uh, to grow uh, further. Uh, you also mentioned before that this business is quite uh, cyclical, and, and uh, this is also what we have seen historically. Uh, as soon as airlines see green figures, you just get massive capacity into the market, and everybody starts losing again. Uh, I think hopefully we are we are smarter today than than, uh, than in the past, and uh, I think the the key is is uh, also to make sure that uh, that uh, our owners and investors uh, get return on their investment. And for some reason, also in the airline industry, people uh, seem to think that as soon as the airlines start uh, earning money, they are criminals. It is not like that. It just it is just like every other business. You are in this to. Uh, to connect people, you are in this business to connect uh, businesses. Uh, of course, you're also in this business to make sure that you uh, get a, a, a fair uh, return to your to your investors. And when where you uh, end up on the on the latter depends on your your business model. We believe that we have created a a niche model that uh, works well for us and and uh, uh, and Iceland as a as a uh, economy. And we see a lot of opportunities to, to grow that further. And is, is that going to be damaged though, by the growth of low cost? We heard, uh, of course, Kevin can't tell us which low cost carrier he was, he was speaking about in his research here in Europe, but we know one that has begun in the last 18 months or so and has had some success after a shaky start but uh, in terms of reliability issues, but uh, seemingly scoring very high, getting good traffic figures. Um, your neighboring competitor in Iceland, I think, announced yesterday they're going to launch some more US routes uh, with wide bodied aircraft, WOW uh, Airlines. Um, Helgi and Nat, what do you both believe about the long haul low cost model? Is it going to become as significant in the long haul arena as it has done in short haul low cost? If you just continue. Maybe I can start. I said in the beginning, it, uh, everybody seems to be moving in the middle, uh, and I think we will get the new uh, carriers on the, on the transatlantic. And I'm also pretty sure that, that uh, somebody in Ireland is going to watch very closely and, and learn from the mistakes of the ones that are, uh, have already started uh, introducing this model. What's your feeling, Nas? I think Helgi and I were laughing earlier as, as we met each other, and I, I told him I had lived in Minneapolis for 11 years, and so he said, well, so you knew Iceland Air very well. And I said, yes, I do. And you've been around for 80 years because passengers know what to expect from Iceland Air. You've done a very effective job of, of tailoring your product to that and been very financially successful in doing it. I think the formula to beating or continuing for Delta to be effective and any carrier to be effective against low cost long haul is does your product offering resonate with what customers want? And so one of our initiatives I referenced earlier is we have three or four different products on the same shell. So we offer business class, flatbed seating, you know, top line meals, et cetera, club access, that far surpasses anything that a low cost long haul carrier is going to offer. And then we have a premium economy. And so you continue to go down, but at the bottom level of our airplane from a price perspective, we have a product that we think stacks up very well against low cost long haul. And then we supplement that with a punctuality record that is, is second to none in the U.S., one that we've even gone and in sales contracts guaranteed our performance will be better than our U.S. competitors, and if it isn't, we'll compensate you for that. We have staff and a, and a culture advantage we think that cannot be replicated, and so it really gives us a lot of different ways to, to resonate with customers. And we feel, look, we just need to continue to focus on those various points for everybody, tailor your experience to as many people as you can, we will never have the lowest cost in the industry. We know that. Um, I think if you look back historically in the U.S., that's what led to a lot of the downturn and the bankruptcies in the mid-2000s, as you had very efficient low-cost carriers that had better products than the high-cost carriers did, of which I, to, I was employed by one of them. That's a tough place to be. 
And so one needs to decide if you're not going to have the lowest cost to be, g be able to compete in that arena, you better have some products that, and things, that brand loyalty that resonates with passengers. And Raphael, in the IATA context, your European members, uh, what is the kind of talk on the street about long haul low cost? I mean, one of your members here in Europe is now beginning its own in house, uh, i.e., Lufthansa with its uh, long haul Eurowings brand or uh, operator. Yeah. Well, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, the European, as you said, there are, there are some already trying it, but obviously I think uh, there is an element where, where you see the most successful experiences in low cost has been in markets that are, let's say, more liberalized, right? You, you have to have that. Uh, also, I guess you, you need to have certain conditions. I mean, when we talk about these experiments being conducted, they're being conducted in general in areas where uh, there is, uh, 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 let's say, uh, an economic capacity to sustain that, right? I mean, not every place can sustain uh, long haul flights point to point because this is another element of the low cost, uh, you know, that you, you, you still are focusing on point to point travel. So I think uh, obviously Lufthansa, as you just said, doing that well, the German market can sustain point to point to many destinations, obviously, but that's not, necess not necessarily the case everywhere in Europe or everywhere in the US. So uh, I think that model in terms of what we've been hearing from the member uh, or, or at least the European carriers is that probably is still to be seen. There are a lot of tests being done either like the Lufthansa or as, as uh, not just said in Delta. I mean, you have already separations in these uh, carriers where you have the premium economy, but you also have classes that are quite competitive in price if you look at not only the European, the Americans, but also uh, many of the Middle Eastern or Gulf carriers where you, you do have high competitive mm -hmm. prices that are pretty, pretty close to what the low cost long hauls are charging, if you would. So still too early to, be, uh, to, to understand where is this gonna go. But, and, and, and then there is a component, obviously, of the, of the equipment, right? I mean, not every equipment is fit for every destination. So we do have today, we're basing this argument, I guess, on basically um, two aircrafts, more or less, right? And, and, and then, uh, and also not considering the hub model or non-hub model, which, again, from, from the IATA perspective, is not about having one or the other. I think both are needed, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. So, uh, it's, it's too early to say where it's going to go, but everybody, I think it's a good experiment to, to yeah, see. I think watching it's going to drive, it, it, it's going to drive customer benefits mm -hmm. like, at the end, right? Because people are going to be able to reach every place of the globe in a very um, efficient way, economical way, and that's great. I mean, you see people now traveling with so much ease compared to 10 or, or 15 or 20 years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, so I think this is what's going it, to, it's going to drive, uh, it, it's better for the customer overall. Yeah. I'm conscious time is beating you, so I'm, I'm using this little bit of extra time we were allowed for late kickoff. Uh, who would like to ask a question to a panel, anybody from the floor? Uh, we get a microphone as quickly as we can, which is a gentleman.